Do you remember your first communion? Maybe your memories go back a little bit further than that. I remember going to church with my grandmother. She was Anglican, and um, they celebrated the Lord's Supper every week. And so as even a young child, I remember during that time in the service going forward with her, not that I could take it with her, but I would be kneeling there and praying, and often the minister would come forward and, and kind of in a cross motion uh, bless children and, and others who couldn't take part in it yet. But I do remember taking confirmation classes much later. But one thing I remember about the service as I was younger is that when the minister got to a point where he was going to read what, what Jesus actually said, he would ring a little bell. It was kind of like an audible version of the red letters in our, in our scriptures. And so it really stood out on my mind even before I took any class. But eventually I got to take part in communion as well. And we're going to do that a little bit later in service. Since we're reading through the Gospel of Mark as a church, let's read his account of the Lord's Supper together. It's in chapter 14. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go prepare the Passover meal for you? So Jesus sent two of them into Jerusalem with these instructions. As you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare the meal. So the two disciples went into the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. In the evening, they arrived with the twelve. As they were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you eating here with me will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, am I the one? He replied, it is one of you twelve who is eating from the bowl with me, for the Son of Man must die, as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I tell you the truth, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Father, we thank you already for what you've done in this service in preparing our hearts as we've been worshiping you and reflecting on the truth of what you've already done for us. And so in these next few moments, we pray that you would really illuminate what it is you have for us from those that may have taken part in the Lord's Supper dozens, if not hundreds of times, to someone who might be able to do it for the first time today. We thank you that we get to commune both with you and with each other, even in this virtual way today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we unpack the passage about the Lord's Supper, our goal today is to understand the significance to remember Christ's sacrifice for us, to learn about God's character and his love for us, and to be inspired by this life-changing event and truth. Our passage is divided into three sections. You're going to see this, that it, it goes from prepare to declare to share. And so that's part of the theme today, you'll notice. And as we start in the prepare section, we're going to kind of walk through, uh, starting back at, at verse 12 in Mark, where it says, on the, on the first night of the festival of unleavened bread, well, this festival was one week long, while Passover was at least initially that one evening, that first evening and night. And we learn in Exodus 12 that unleavened, it means no yeast because they were to eat the meal with urgency. And when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, it's a sacrifice of a one-year-old sheep or a goat with no defects. And you'd put its blood on the doorpost and God would pass over that home. And chapter 12 of Exodus shares about even the meal instructions that you're to roast that meat over a fire and eat it along with bitter salad greens and bread made without yeast. They actually had to remove every trace of yeast from their homes because they had to be able to prepare to eat with urgency. 
And throughout the passage, we're going to see that Jesus is our Passover lamb. Just as the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So continuing in Mark, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go prepare the Passover meal for you? And then in verse 13, it says that Jesus sent two of them. Luke's account actually says that it's uh, Peter and John that he sends. And so he sends the two of them into Jerusalem with these instructions. As you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. Many say that this man probably would have instantly stood out to Peter and John because think about this culture at that time. It was usually women who would be uh, carrying the water, doing that task. And in verse 14, it says, As he enters the house, say to the owner, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room that I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? You know, Matthew includes, My time has come. And it's also phrased more of a statement than a question. And he says, I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. John writes, Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to the Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. I love the footnote that says, he showed them the full extent of his love. And this is what John wants you to know. He wants you to be certain of God's love for you. God demonstrates his love for us through Jesus. Sometimes, it's only been a few times so far that I've done premarital counseling for someone else, but I'll often read from Ephesians 5, and I'll usually ask, starting with the bride-to-be, to be patient with me as I read the first part, because it can sound kind of strange in today's culture. I say, Paul writes, wives, submit to your husbands. But then I say, now listen to the next part, though. Then husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And usually their eyes get bright if they're aware of of the context of what I'm talking about. So I would ask that soon-to-be husband, and how did Christ love the church? And I remember the first time I ever asked someone this, he kind of gulped and said, he gave his life for her. And that's how much that Christ loves us. Back to verse 15, it says that he will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up, and that is where you should prepare our meal. So we're going to see this recurring theme throughout the passage, prepare and then already set up. They have to prepare, but then they find that it's already set up. And in verse 16, it says, so the two disciples, that's Peter and John, we now know, they went into the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. Just more confirmation that Jesus is who he says he is, and that the things he says will be just as Jesus had said, prepare, already set up. This moves us kind of into the declare, but there's also kind of a turning point in the story. The Last Supper is included in the synoptic gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And that term, synoptic gospels, it basically just means that the same general form and model is used throughout those three, and they're very similar. There's many overlapping stories and parables, and all four gospels include major events like John the Baptist preparing the way, Jesus' baptism, the calling of his disciples, the feeding of the 5,000, the triumphant entry, his anointing, the crucifixion, the resurrection. Uh, But John's account doesn't have the same form with the Last Supper, but it does include the surrounding context of the Passover meal. But all four Gospels contain the betrayal. Verse 17 says, In the evening, uh, Jesus arrived with the twelve. They're about to drop down to 11 and, uh, until after the resurrection and ascension. And R- Luke actually writes about how they replaced the 12th in the book of Acts. And in verse 18, as they were eating at the table, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you eating with me here will betray me. Luke includes sitting among us as friends. That makes the betrayal sting all the more. So verse 19, greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, am I the one? And Matthew's account includes Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, you have said it. John's account has a few more details. John was actually sitting next to or reclined next to Jesus at the table, and Peter motioned to him, 
who's he talking about? Ask him. And so he leaned over and said, Lord, who is it? And Jesus responded, it is the one to whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. And when he had dipped it, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. It's important to also note that in each of the four gospel accounts, they include Judas's decision and agreement to betray Jesus before going into the passage about the Lord's Supper. We know it's coming, and Jesus is just about to explain how he knows it's coming too. Verses 20 and 21 say that Jesus replied, It is one of you twelve who is eating from the bowl with me. For the Son of Man must die, as the Scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it would be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Now here's something to highlight from that passage. As the Scriptures declared long ago. Because it's prepared and then now declared and it's already set up. But it's, it's absurd what takes place in Luke's account. It says they began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. Isn't that crazy? Timing, context. No, guys, I'm telling you about who's going to be the worst and you're wondering about who's going to be the greatest. But this gave Jesus yet another opportunity to teach his disciples and us another lesson of what his kingdom is like and how his followers should act. Jesus said, among you, it will be different. The leader should be like the servant. And John's gospel uh, includes Jesus washing the, the disciples' feet. And think about that. He washes the disciples' feet. He washes the one who would betray him. He washes the feet of the one who would deny him. And he washes the feet of all the ones who would abandon him. And when he was finished washing their feet, he said, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Many people say this is where we get the platinum rule, not the golden rule. That's the do to others whatever you would like them to do to you, taken from the law of Moses. And he mentions that even in the Sermon on the Mount. But no, this, he takes it to the highest possible level. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. It's not just some new rule, it's a new commandment. The new commandment he gives to them on the final night before his death. Love each other just as I have loved you. There's no greater love. Jesus showed them the full extent of his love and now he wants them to show each other love in the same way. And think about what Jesus is instilling to his disciples throughout this. Follow me, remember me, love each other. Remember his initial call to them, follow me. And now he's saying, remember me. And he's also giving this example and then saying, love each other. Why? Because he says that your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So we share his love with one another so that we can share his love with the world. And this moves into that section, share. Now we turn back to the meal. And verse 22 says, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread, blessed it, he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take it for this is my body. And did you notice the pattern? Now this is someone else's sermon for another day, but notice the pattern. He took, he blessed, he broke, he gave. Notice that pattern, took, blessed, broke, gave. Others have observed this as a pattern, not only from the Lord's Supper, but really the entire life of Jesus. And more than that, it's a theme of many individuals throughout scripture. Luke adds Jesus saying, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Luke also adds, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And this is where we get that phrase, do this in remembrance of me. Passover was already about remembering how God led his people out of Egypt. It's the same God who led them out of slavery from Egypt is now the same God leading them out of slavery from sin. Verses 23 and 24 say, And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them. They all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. Luke's account also includes two different cups of wine. He actually begins with, take this and share it among yourselves. 
for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. The share it among yourselves and the they all drank from it is an important part of the Lord's Supper. This is partly why we refer to it as communion, a shared harmony, not only between us and God, but between our brothers and sisters in Christ. And remember, the Lord's Supper occurs on Thursday evening, just before the prayer in the garden, before the betrayal takes place, when Jesus says, this is my body, as with this is my blood, it's foreshadowing to the next day. We call it Good Friday now. They will put him through trial. They will beat and mock him. They will whip him 39 times and place a crown of thorns on his head, kneeling and mocking him, calling him the king of the Jews. All of this before nailing him to a Roman cross to be crucified. For everyone else to see, it's Passover. And so imagine how many people have come to Jerusalem from far and wide. His blood is a sacrifice, whether they realize it yet or not. And this is where we see another parallel between the first Passover and the Last Supper. Moses said, do this to remember God delivering us out of Egypt. A lamb would be sacrificed and its blood on a doorpost would serve as a sign. But Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. This time it's deliverance from sin. A lamb would be sacrificed his blood on a cross would serve as a sign. The radical difference between the first Passover and the last supper is the shepherd becomes the lamb because Jesus is our Passover lamb. God so loved the world that he gave his son and the son was willing to be sacrificed for us. Jesus displayed the full extent of his love for us. God deliver us from sin and death, thanks to the precious blood of Jesus Christ, we're given a new starting line for a new life. And think of what John the Baptist declares. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Before studying these passages this week, I originally thought my sermon title and focus would be The Last Supper Equals the New Covenant. Because verse 24 says the blood of Jesus confirms the covenant between God and his people. And what is covenant? Well, it's an agreement. The first or old covenant was between God and Abraham recorded in Genesis. And so Jesus is making a bold statement that his blood confirms a new covenant. The last supper, the new covenant. Think about how our Bibles are actually divided into two sections. There's the Old Testament and there's the New Testament. Because in, in Genesis, God makes a covenant beginning with Abraham for him, for his descendants, and eventually the whole world would be blessed by it. Jesus is the descendant, some people, scholars would say, the seed, singular, of Abraham. And Jesus ushers in the new covenant with the new, or the new testament. His birth begins, his life fulfills, his death confirms, and his resurrection ensures Though Jesus, through Jesus, the original promise of the covenant with Abraham is fulfilled, and it expanded beyond one group of people, Israel, and now for everyone else, the Gentiles to the ends of the earth are included. The, the, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is for the entire world. When he says his blood is poured out for many, and Matthew adds to forgive the sins of many, it actually means all. His sacrifice for forgiveness of our sins. This is the heart of the gospel. I love what it says in Psalm 103, 12. It says, he has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. And that's a great picture. And think about the context. In a general sense, they would have thought, you know, east and west, they will never meet since they're pointing in opposite directions. But there's actually another picture I want you to consider today. You know, the Bible explains that God is forgiving. Not that he will reluctantly forgive if you beg him. No, he actually wants to forgive. He is waiting to forgive, and forgiveness is in his nature. Well, I found the Hebrew word for forgiving is nasa, which means to lift up, to carry, or even to take away. To lift up, nasa. Do you see what's kind of funny about that? Picture our sins being lifted up and carried away into space. Not just billionaire barely touching the edge of space, kind of something like that, but no, our sin actually carried away out of this 
galaxy on a mission to take it light years away from here. After studying this week, I believe the Last Supper is also an answer to the Lord's Prayer, where we ask, Lord, forgive us, forgive us of our sins, and Lord, deliver us, deliver us from evil or rescue us from the evil one. Jesus is the answer to this prayer. And one more thing regarding forgiveness. I believe there's another parallel from the first Passover to the Last Supper. Exodus 12, 4 explains, you are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. God determined that Jesus, our Passover lamb, is more than enough for everyone who will ever need his forgiveness. Verse 25 of Mark says, our passage, it actually concludes with this, I tell you the truth, I will not drink wine again until I drink it in the kingdom of God. And Matthew says, until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Matthew and Mark also add, then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives and were about to do the same. I mentioned earlier about my grandmother taking me to church and that was my first experiences. She's the the one that really taught me, uh, Jesus loves me, this I know. Um, the one that sat beside me took me to, to church, and, and really my first experiences with the Lord's Supper are next to her. But I remember um, not long before we lost her, I remember having a conversation in private with her after church one time. I, I would come home from college, and um, I remember her saying to me, I hope that I'm good enough. As in, I, I hope that I'm good enough to go to heaven. Uh, I had no idea how long I would have with her, but um, I was thinking of the woman who really showed me unconditional love, the one who really taught me to pray, who uh, sometimes forced me to go to church, but the one who, who drug me to church, um, the one who taught me really, who gave me a moral compass at all, is wondering if she's good enough. And I remember talking with her and saying, well, you believe, don't you? And, and you've asked for forgiveness. And, you know, I was just thinking about all these things that I could ask uh, of her. But she was just wondering. She was kind of hoping, not knowing that she could have an assurance of her salvation. And it made me think of what John Wesley described his experience. He said that, I felt I did trust in Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, And save me from the law of sin and death. Well, I I believe this assurance comes from the Holy Spirit and it's reinforced by Scripture and and it's made tangible in the Lord's Supper. And and really, I had to kind of explain, kind of in my own words, this is 20 years ago now, what I explained to my grandmother, but I, I got to pray with her and just so she could be sure of that. And I didn't know that I was gonna lose her. Um, tragically, the next summer. But it made me think of this uh, today. What was really hard for especially my grandfather and I, the first Christmas without her, was that there's a gap at our table, a, a place where she was missing, where she always and should have been. And doesn't that make you think today of how Jesus actually sets up a place at the table for us And we can know that. We can be reminded of that. Did you need to be reminded of that today? Remember, just as he said, it's hope for the future because part of this will be fulfilled in the future. And next time won't be him parting the sea. He will come and he will part the clouds. He is preparing. And one day we'll see it's already set up, just as he said. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, because he will remember us.
Today's service is really centered around this moment and the opportunity that we have to come before the table. And you've already heard this, but the way Paul shares it in 1 Corinthians 11 is he says, For I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is given for you. Preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Take it, eat it. Eat this remembering that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving.
And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is shed for you, preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Drink this remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Apostle Peter writes, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he's been revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God and you have placed your faith and hope in God because Christ, because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love for each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart for you have been born again, not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. As the scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And the word that word is the good news which was preached to you. 